Hi everybody, we're the Skeleton Crew, and this week we're going to be telling you all about Pentaceratops in a video we estimate will take nine minutes to watch, but probably two hours to record. <laughs> Before we get started, I'm told that we have to introduce ourselves. My name is James Napoli. I am a postdoctoral researcher at North Carolina State University and the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. My name is Amelia Zitlow. I'm a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History. My name is Scott Johnston. I am the vertebrate paleontology fossil preparator and technician at the Harvard University Museum of Comparative Zoology, coming at you with better audio and lighting. Hi, I'm Alex Rubenstone. I'm a PhD candidate here at Yale University, and I look at and respond, well, almost respond to all of your comments. And I'm Dalton Meyer, also a PhD candidate at Yale University. And together, we're the we're Skeleton, the skeleton, the skeleton crew. crew. And we're slightly hey, out of sync. That was close enough. We that always are. One of the better ones. That was, we're, we're getting, guys. we're improving. By the end of this series that'll have like 120 episodes in it, we'll all say it at the exact same time. We will have perfectly <laughs> memorized the ping to each other's locations and we'll be able to perfectly compensate for it. Dalton, why don't you show us these animals as they come into the world? Certainly. They're all very excited. Oh, they're they very pretty. Well, you know how we kind of, we complained, and James, you brought it up in the Triceratops video, that the Triceratops kind of animations and the way it presents in the game isn't quite as as regal as we would want a Ceratopsian to be. I think this one makes up for it, or at least it lives up to kind of how regal we want these animals to appear. They're a good... Man, they look weird. Man, their heads are weird. They've yeah, no, I was gonna say, I don't think they look regal as much as like cursed bison energy. <laughs> which, what is this? Like, I did, here, I but... like. Yeah. I think they move regally, but I don't think they look incredibly regal. Like, I, I think the animations don't like, they don't trundle as much as Triceratops does. Well, yeah. They got kind of a grace, like a, a graceful long leg. They're leggy. They got gams. <laughs> yeah, they they remind gams. me of like, they remind me of like a giraffe. I don't know, like, because they've got those weird tall so shoulders, but they're kind of moving gracefully, even though they're gangly and weird. How are we liking the cinematic camera, by the way? It's very I, cinematic. I, I like it. I wish it didn't go as far away sometimes. Yeah, that's... Man, that bump is bizarre. It's unfortunate. So, so what's weird about the bump is that uh, they had that. That's just a real factor. Or, this bump here. A, re a real character of Which, which specimen shows these animals. It? I was going to say, I, if, can you send it to the chat? Because I was looking at their skeletons and I didn't see it. They've got like um, weird long shoulders, but I didn't see anything in their, the neural it, spines. It is something that is stated in several of the... I'll need to actually dig through and find Scott specific sources things. he made it the up. My sources that <laughs> I made it the, the up. Dr. Manhattan meme. It's not Dr. Manhattan, it's... Uh, it's, it's Metal, uh, Gear, Metal Rising. Gear Solid. I've seen I've seen it with Doctor Manhattan as well. Oh, the the originals from a a, a Metal Gear Rising video. <laughs> but um, it is consistently stated as one of the things that is relatively unique about Pentaceratops is that it has a very short torso and a very arched uh, spine and giving it kind of a humpback appearance. So what is it? A PhD student? Oh my god. Because our um, posture's bad, because we're... Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. We're always segmenting those scans. <laughs> I think that the hump would not have been this pronounced in real life. Probably. Because I think what it is is an expanded nuchal ligament attachment site. Like, so you have, well, not only nuchal ligament, neck muscles as well. Your, your axial muscles attach to the neural spines of the vertebrae. And you have muscles that connect your head to your back. I can't think of any reason why this animal would need, you know, a lot of attachment sites for its head. I can't think of any reason at all. I can't think of any reason at all. It certainly doesn't have a gigantic off-balance cranial crest that's rising like <laughs> 15 feet into the air from its, from its Wait, mouth. Wait, but James, have you considered uh, that it's um, for sexual display because we can't explain what it does otherwise? Oh my god, that's what the back is for. They had a sale. 
They, they <laughs> like, oh god. It's display. Oh. Uh, I, I really hope, we don't have to cut this, but I really hope the Spinosaurus video comes out after whatever the next f***ing Spinosaurus thing's gonna be from Ibrahim and Mateo. I think that's probably a few way, like, a while off, so. I, I want Spinosaurus to stop. <laughs> I want there to be a last paper about Spinosaurus. I always I, like I referring to, to it. Anymore. I always like referring to it as, oh, have you caught the the annual re-release of uh, the annual patch notes of Spinosaurus? Right. It's caught. <laughs> it get... Well, on the, uh, the last paper to reference Spinosaurus will also be the only paper to reference Spinosaurus because it will be a paper in which I explain how I built a time machine. And then said, and all is said in like one of the footnotes is it was used. It was used to remove all remains of a problematic taxon. <laughs> See, no, Alex, if if you had a time machine, I would guarantee that you would go back in time, be the only human to ever see one in real life, and refuse to tell anybody what it looked like. I draw it differently every time I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my friend in college who lost four of or four of his fingers, and would tell every single person he talked to a different story of how he lost his fingers. Joker. Oh my god, no, I know what I'd do. I'd go back in time. I would take photographs of every Spinosaur that's ever existed and then just put them all on a table and be like, okay, figure out which one's Spinosaurus aegypticus. <laughs> I would curse them with knowledge. Oh my god. Alright, well, so we should talk hey, about this dinosaur. So I think what's happening... Is it too long? It looks... Short. A little. So... Well, I'm just looking at the mounted skeleton, which I believe... Oh, damn. I thought I knew where the... Is it at the Sam Noble Museum? Sam there's a, Noble Museum. There's a couple. I think the only... In... Oh, right. Because this thing's not from, like, the two other places that all the ornithischians in this game are from, right? This is not... No. Parker it's, Hill no, it's from well, the Kirtland formation. Yes, and I want to talk about Asterisk that later, but let's let Amelia keep going. Dinosaur I'm just... Park, I, yes. Sorry, I saw someone... You said the noble pentaceratops. Like, no, I don't want... That's, that's what I thought, maybe. But it, no, it's not... It it's from New Mexico. So Sam Noble shouldn't... might have one, though. It's... I, it's from Mexico or New Mexico? New. Wait, wait. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, it's wait. definitively the Kirkland Formation Kirtland. and Kirtland, sorry. The Kirtland Formation, the Fruitland Formation, and then there's some questionable stuff. Mm -hmm. it, there's one in Colorado? Interesting. The yeah. one at the Sam Noble what? Museum is not Pentaceratops. Oh, is, is that the, the It's other Titanoceratops. One? Yes, okay, sorry. So that's the scale. Which was like... for a long time to be Penny. Right. And it's, this guy's this guy's on the upper side of Ceratopsian size wise. I think they're pretty big. Amelia, we saw this guy at the CNA. <clears throat> Did we? I think so. I think that's the only postcranial skeleton I'm aware of that's on display. See, that's like complete. yeah. Let me look yeah pull up that at, picture. Anyway, no. I so the picture, the one picture that I've been able to find on Google of a mounted postcranial specimen of Pentaceratops, which I guess is not even pen Pentaceratops. Um is at the Sam Noble Museum, and that's that Titanoceratops thing. And it's, the hump on the back is, like, behind its shoulders, so it's not like this. It's like, I mean, which is interesting. Well, so it's a neck muscle attachment site, I think, and, it, like, that would clinch it. Like, this animal has a gigantic cranial crest. It probably needed expanded ligaments and muscles to support the weight of the head. And right. So you'd get those, they'd attach well, to the, like, anterior dorsals. No, no. So what I'm getting at is that it doesn't look like like a bison. I wanna, I'm gonna send a screen. I'm gonna send a screenshot of this picture to the group chat really quick, so I can because I'm not articulating this properly. Um, it doesn't look like a bison, which is what this like. This animal looks like it has the bison thing going on, but that is not yes. what this what it looks like. You'll see what I mean. Like it's in the middle of the back. It's not between the shoulders, which is where it is in bison. Oh right, right, right. You see oh, what I mean? Okay, yeah. So, yeah, okay, I mean, I'm not saying it's not an attachment point for neck muscles. I'm just saying it is not in that location. I see. So I'm yeah, wondering... I see, I see what you mean. Yeah, so, because, like, I'm wondering if, like, why they made this one this way. So, <laughs> I, I, looking at, like, skeletal diagrams of Pentaceratops, it seems like it's kind of restored in a, in a way that would lead... I'll, I'll link that in chat so you can see. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that I've seen, too, but, like, what are they referencing? I don't know. So that... I think... Some of it's based off of the like postcrania of Utah ceratops. Well, we have we have a solid postcrania of of Pentaceratops. Pentaceratops was uh, uh, one of the ones that we had really good solid postcrania for it 
relatively early because this thing was from the 20s. Wait, yeah. I actually made a list. Of? Uh, when all the game uh, dinosaurs in the game were discovered. And Did you really? Was named. Oh, that's amazing. Why? Because we all have our own special interests. Uh, Pentaceratops, the genus was named in 23. But it was discovered in 21. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my dates are just naming, because yeah. a lot of this shit's discovered and not worked on. For well, I also years. know that the earliest fossils of Pentaceratops were actually, like, sent to Sweden. It yeah. was not Sweden? named by the Swedes, thank God. It was named by the Americans. <laughs> it, Do you and wanna... given a good, sensible name. Do you really want to thank God for... Our good Lord and Savior, Henry Fairfield Osborne. Well, 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 no. At least he wasn't Swedish. <laughs> no, I know, but at least he wasn't a Swede. <laughs> say what you will about Henry Fairfield Osborne, at least he wasn't Swedish. You certainly can't say he was Swedish. God knows he wishes he was. <laughs> he, he may have been a horrible racist, but... James, how dare Swedish. you say this about our own mother? Um, Emmanuel Schopp isn't Swedish, he's Swiss. I confuse this all the time. <laughs> uh oh, bad it's, luck. It's swishish and. Dalton, I have oh. a very dumb question. What's your question? Is the animal comfort off? Yes. Okay. I was like, man, I don't think you can have this many of them together in the game. No, I always turn animal comfort off. That way we don't have a thousand notifications of unhappy dinosaurs. I like oh, we that bumped social. Him. Yeah, it's really nice. Just a little push. Ooh, and maybe that's that that we you know that that's not a bad jumping off point for like uh, the interaction between these animals. Those frills. That's a very tall, long frill uh, with two very big holes in it that you probably don't want to do a lot of uh, smashing with. Yes. So if you had to bump your friend, you'd probably bump them on the side, because this could be an example of something that actually is a display structure. And I'd believe it because it's enormous and dumb. <laughs> this is yeah. almost certainly a display structure. I, I mean, I mean, listen. I don't know if I would say that. I don't think these animals use their horns that face forward to, in intra-specific combat. I definitely don't think the frill was like defensive armor the way people seem to want it to be. Now, are you saying that for Pentaceratops or Ceratopsians generally? Most Ceratopsians. I think the arrangement of the horns is suggestive to me of some role in ceremonial combat. Also, animals that have weapons tend to use them for that. Mm -hmm. Generally. <laughs> right. As we talked about a long time ago in a video series that we've since killed in the crib. Because um, you guys didn't like them. Because <laughs> so many more of you watched these. Um, <laughs> But we talked about a recent paper that came out about ankylosaurs that focused on Zool that found that their tail clubs were probably used for, like, intra-specific combat. So maybe fights for the right to mate, fights for dominance territory, not for defense against predators. And the paper they also... Used them... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, the paper persuasively argues that most times that animals have weapons, that's what they're used for primarily. Like, the driver to evolve weaponry is not defense. It's usually sexual um, sexual selection. So rituals that involve mating either before mating or impressing members of the opposite sex, so on and so forth. That's not to say they don't okay. use them defensively when they need to, but that doesn't seem to be the primary driver in most cases. Interesting. Yeah. Check out our video. Are we talking about this? Please, it's our least watched video on the entire channel. Is it really? <laughs> it still is. Yeah. It's amazing. Did it break a thousand? It did eventually break a thousand, but for a long Huzzah! time, we had many videos with thousands of views and one that had like 880. Ah, <laughs> oh, yikes. It, it's amazing. So I thought you were going to reference back to the Triceratops video because that's an example of one Ceratopsian that does not have holes in its frill, mm -hmm. which is interesting and different. Did we talk it about like it's you know, absence of holes in frill is not totally unrelated to presence of T-Rex in ecosystem. It, yeah, think, yeah, yeah. We made a joke about that. We said yeah. everything was closing up its its fenestre. I called it the pucker factor yeah. of T-Rex. Right. And go back and watch <laughs> I, that video if you want to see Scott say pucker factor of T-Rex again. <laughs> or just watch this one again, because you just said it. Um, yeah. Is that, so, is, there's, uh, there's evidence within, like, Triceratops of, like, what's believed to be scarring, right? On the frill, I yeah. believe so. There's... On the frill from other Triceratops horns, right? 
right? There is a Taurosaurus at the Milwaukee Public Museum that has a puncture in its frill that's mm. partially healed that's believed to have been from another Taurosaurus. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Oh, interesting. So Taurosaurus, where they do have big, big fat holes. Yeah, but the hole, and it's, oh, um, it's in the lower, I want to say it's the lower left portion of the frill. I don't know which bone that would that be epiparietal? In the lower On left the upper portion? portion? Well, no, the epiparietals are small ossifications around the edge. If it's one of the I'm sorry, not I'm, I'm sorry, not epi, just regular parietal. Wait, can you? Oh, uh, can you? It's a frontoparietal shelf. Is it on like if? Is it the top? This oh, doesn't or matter or for it... anyone. No, 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 no. Show me on this doll where the. Show, show <laughs> me. Don't, Shut up, dweeb. Don't I want to move know. your cursor until Emilio says that's where it is. <laughs> okay, hang on. I'll pause the video. Yeah, actually, this is about there. Actually, yeah, okay. so like in a little bit, but down there. Like it's away from the hole. Like here. That's gonna be yeah. the squamosal, right? Well, the, yes. So parietal the would be. The horns... Yeah. Yeah. Think... Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Parietal would be in the middle. Wait. Is it? Guess... Hold on. I need to check something before we can continue this conversation well, because it's I. It's like the. Yeah. It's like the skull roof has been rotated out, right? Like just kind of flex it. Yeah, I just don't know which bones yes, exactly make up the frill. Okay, it is the squamosal. Okay. Yeah. Another that makes correct sense. answer for James Napoli. Okay, so I'm then the parietal is in the middle of the frill. Yeah. Okay. And the, yeah, okay. top. Middle and back. Well, yeah, top, I guess. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so, anyways. So, yes, that's where it is. It's away from the fenestra a yeah. little bit. And There's that doesn't... An... Go on. I was going to say, that doesn't surprise me. Like, yeah, as Alex was saying, it doesn't behoove them to be, like, jabbing each other right in in the holes but like any animal that's roughhousing like this is gonna be injuring in themselves and each other like ritualistic combat is often i i hesitate to say designed but performed in such a way to minimize injury of the combatants yeah because that doesn't help anyone but i mean it is still like slamming big animals slamming into each other and they are gonna get hurt so that's interesting because there was that paper a couple months ago years ago i don't know i don't have any sense of time um about ago. Is it really that long? Time has no! continued to pass. Oh, disgusting. Um, anyways, okay, so there was a paper apparently two years ago that came out about uh, tyrannosaurs biting each other's faces. And what they found, or part of what they found was that the bites were localized at the fronts of their snouts, um, which is away from these big uh, holes that they have in their faces. Um, so I'm trying to remember where this was going. Uh, something about, god damn it, holes in their faces less likely to cause injury or death right yeah and someone someone said something about um when animals evolve weapons like this like they're minimizing the odds of hurting each other yeah, well I, we kind of we i think that was both me and dalton kind of said something sim like yeah. i said when animals evolve mm -hmm. weapons they use them for interspecific combat and dalton brought up the point that like interspecific like, combat usually is, is performed so as to minimize injury right right Here yeah so that's Right, yeah, and so that idea of like minimizing injury during intraspecific combat is is shown in the tyrannosaurs only biting the fronts of their snouts, so they're not puncturing those holes, um, in their in their faces. But because the holes in the faces of theropods are very different from the holes in the backs of the skulls of the ceratopsians, like wouldn't there not be? I guess it wouldn't be like I guess what I'm getting at is it wouldn't be as bad for a ceratopsian to puncture a frill hole as it would be for a tyrannosaur to puncture their face holes, <laughs> if that makes sense. Well, right, yeah, because yes. cause the tyrannosaur face holes are, are, they're essentially pneumatic diverticulae of the respiratory system. So if you're bleeding right. into your, right, although they don't commute, like, they're not going to communicate. No, uh, they're, the I mean, they're, but it'd be a but super they're still high one for They're part of so. the nasal epithelial, like, they're part of that kind of mm -hmm. tissue system. Right. Right, so it's the, the choice sorry, between the sinus know. infection from hell yeah. or, like, right. A very bad laceration, which like neither one is great, but I'd rather have a bad cut than like introduce sepsis into my sinuses. Right. Yeah. Speaking of sinus infection from hell, that's what I had last weekend. Yeah. Um, I've had one of those for about ten years, and that oh is, every every winter, every time the weather changes rapidly, I have headaches constantly. I've had Jesus. a headache for two weeks. Jesus. Um, yeah, it's it's really not fun. The one thing that I would bring up about that paper, I don't actually remember, Amelia, and I, I would need to check the paper, which I'm not going to do right now. I'll throw up a note in yep. editing if, if this is wrong. <laughs> I don't actually think the people in the paper said that explicitly. Like, that is where they found the bite marks. 
But I yeah. don't remember if that was something they say explicitly in the paper or if that was part of the discourse or even maybe just you and I talking with like, I, everybody here about it. Yeah, no, and that's not yeah. when you say it, like, again, I didn't, I remember, I did, that is one, that is a dinosaur paper that I did read because I thought it was really interesting and, like, somewhat relevant to the stuff that I work on because mosasaurs are often found with battle scars. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's interesting, like, that they had a, a big enough... Like, it's a similar situation that I have where it is a big enough sample size where you can actually start to see patterns like that. Like, if it's a, as we talked about in the Zool video, like, if it's a ritualized behavior, the damage is going to be occurring in, like, roughly the same spot in roughly the same way in everybody. Because they're doing it in a particular way. Or, by doing it, I mean, because they're engaging in combat in a particular way every time so as to minimize damage to each other. Right. But also, like, as part of the ritual, like, that's the point. They go through the motions and do the same actions. Um, cause it's, you know, in part programmed. Right. But, the the yeah. uncertainty for me, and I, this is a point that Alex brings up a lot, but you know, it's the, it's the picture of the plane with the bullet holes from World War II, which is, you know, where do you armor the plane? It's probably an apocryphal story about confirmation bias or survivorship bias rather, where the planes that came back from battle missions would have bullet holes in particular areas of the plane. And so the initial idea was that they'd armor those areas to prevent damage from occurring. But then somebody brought up that those were the planes that were returning from the combat mission. And so what they had actually found is where you would have the plane survive being hit. And if it was hit elsewhere, it likely couldn't take the impact and would you know, be destroyed and kill the crew. So the actual decision would be to armor elsewhere. The crucial thing that we can't really control for is what we were looking at in that paper were healed bite wounds on individuals mm, that had mm -hmm. like made it through combat and survived you know the, a sinus infection from a tooth puncture from a tyrannosaur that's gonna have like rotting flesh attached to its teeth and like these were these would have had nasty infecting mouths would be extremely likely to cause an like a really really nasty infection and sinus infections can be really really bad like with humans we control them mm -hmm. and so i do wonder if maybe what we're seeing there is it's likely impossible to tell, but it's possible that tyrannosaurs were kind of socially conditioned enough that they would only bite areas where they weren't going to do lethal damage necessarily. Or that what we're seeing are remains of animals that live through the combat season because they were able to effectively pull back and not be injured in areas where they would otherwise be injured fatally. It, it This is, like, unknowable. Yeah, like, because then also, how would we how would we know from the, I guess, would the sinus infection leave any evidence on the bone that it was there? Because also, like, how do we, what I, I guess what I'm getting is, how do we know that the ones we're finding were not killed by bites to the holes? Because obviously, if you bite a hole, it's not going to leave a mark because it's empty space. Well, there's bone around the hole that would, you'd well, find unhealed yeah. bite wounds around the periphery of that. Well, like, I mean, all, all of what they were finding were tooth gouges that had healed over with reactive bones. Right. So, like, we knew that those animals hadn't been killed by the injuries we were seeing. I mean, yeah. also any any tooth contact that opens skin can cause infection that could kill you and not necessarily leave an impact on the bone. Yeah. Right, but I mean, if it's going right through your antorbital fenestra, that's going to be a super highway for infection to get in. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like that. That's going to be just incredibly, like, very, very quickly Bad. fatal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I mean, not necessarily fatal, but like likely the kind of infection that would leave lesions on the bone mm -hmm. you know because uh, the epithelium's in close contact so if that's getting infected and is reacting you're probably going to see evidence of it i haven't seen anything like that in my work on tyrannosaurs but maybe as i ct scan more and more things i'll find something yeah um in any case you're right that the frill holes in the you know these are the homologue of the super temporal fenestra which is a, essentially a muscle attachment opening that is likely taking on other functions within dinosaurs and other archosaurs. But it, it's, it's fundamentally like the arch of your cheekbone where muscle is passing through. It's not a, it's not a giant pneumatic space like, a, like the antorbital fossa or fenestra. Right. What is so, it, Alex, why'd before, you get so close? Bef well, no, no. This is not to fill your heads with nonsense. But before, before we engaged in this short and concise conversation that is not at all reshot. Um, I, I had wanted to say that something that like, that kind of just popped into my head as we were talking about it and would be very cool to see is that because this is in the super temporal fenestra and it's hypothesized that perhaps that this big structure, at least maybe in something like Pentaceratops is 
a display structure that could have been it could have been bright you know brightly colored could have been a little vascular vascularized and then living crocodilians uh there's all this vascularization in the supertemporal uh finester that's believed to be related to uh or has been hypothesized to be related to cooling the skull uh that the finestra are, are cooler than the surrounding tissue uh casey holiday looked at this in like 2020. and i was thinking damn those are probably super vascularized and if you injured them they would just pump blood <laughs> like that's like a, like a head point. wound and yeah. then the frill is divoted and they're like the natural head angle holds them back so like if you like after post fight these things probably had like a small pool of blood that would just like drip down the front of their face as it overflowed <laughs> a little bit which is very cool <laughs> Cool. Kind of, you mean like how like elephant seals when you see them fighting that like they're all superficial injuries, but they just look like they are painted red afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Where it's like the beach is running red with their blood, and it's just just oh man. As I learned when I was six years old, head injuries bleed a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I so there so I now grow my hair in a way that covers it, but I have a large like several inch long scar right here on my forehead from when I fell when I was a child. I hit my head on the cor the wooden foot of my parents' bed, so it was like this, and it just immediately cut my forehead mm -hmm. down to the bone. And one of my wow. earliest flesh pulled memories is me, my parents trying to walk me to clean the wound before we had to go get me stitches, past a mirror. And not f succeeding in covering my eyes before we passed the mirror, and just seeing <laughs> like just blood running down my entire face. At I, which point I started screaming, "I'm going to die," and uh, <laughs> and then I didn't. But I, I was frightened at the time. Blood orgy. Yeah. A couple of years ago, orgy. I was awoken by my mom at like six in the morning. I was, this is when I was still like in high school, and she's like, "Hi, don't be surprised if there's blood in the hallway." I'm like. <laughs> I'm not awake. I'm like, what? I guess cool. my dad, when he got up to go to the shower, so he's leaving their bedroom, he must have tripped or stumbled or something, and he hit his head on, like, the little door latch thing, you know, on the, yeah, Scott, um, and, you know, <laughs> nicked that open, and so there was, yeah, a stream of blood <laughs> from their bedroom to the bathroom. Um, apparently, he thought he was going to drive himself to the hospital. He thought that if he collected the 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 chunk that had been stuck in the little door thing and put it on some ice and brought it with him that maybe they could put it back and i guess he was going to drive himself and my mom talked him out of it and that's when i was awoken she's like yeah there's blood in the hallway don't worry about it everything's fine we're going to the hospital so oh by the way like i got a perm last night i'm like what and then she left and i had to go about my day <laughs> did he have like a big it wasn't that big it was he still has like a scar there it's like, like it was like Damn. I don't know about that long. It was it wasn't terrible, but also, my God. <laughs> yeah, head injuries just bleed so much, and yeah. I, I think frill injuries on and these they... guys would have been cool to see. Oh yeah, yeah the, like battle. so. It, it reminds me of the uh, the the Pachy uh, the Pachy Rhinosaurus from the Walking with Dinosaur 3D movie, where it has the injury that puts the hole in its frill. That oh, we'll right. see later in this <laughs> series with a different dinosaur that isn't Pachyrhinosaurus. Um, but like that that could happen. Like that is a, a very plausible injury that could be survivable for these animals. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean animals in general can survive much more severe injuries than people might think. Well, it's like you guys have heard the story of how we found out that birds migrate, right? I no. think so. Ooh, so apparently it was that uh, for a long period of human history, it just uh, people just thought that certain species of birds just kind of disappeared uh, during certain parts of the year because we had no <laughs> way of knowing what we happened. Bird object like, <laughs> That's <laughs> colonialism. But like, like uh, disappear. That's either Either they, um, either they were hibernating or s s something like that, but it was just like, oh, these birds just aren't like just don't exist. We just do not see them for this part of part of the year. But then there was uh, a stork that was found mm. in Europe that had a spear from an African hunter through its neck. 
that they found in like Germany and a hunter shot it. And we're and we're like, holy shit, this thing went to Africa. That's where they must go. All birds go to Africa. All that, birds go to Africa. That's insane. I, I want to briefly, before we move off the point of interest specific combat, though, uh, mention like just something in, that Dalton reminded me of, which is like, yes, these animals are trying to not hard, like seriously harm each other most of the time because it's not advantageous for either individual. But like, we do know it happens a lot. There's yeah, a yeah. lot of pictures of deer that have like, I mean, there's the famous image of bucks that have their antlers intertangled in a way that they can't extricate themselves. And one dies during combat, and the other is dragging its corpse until it eventually dies of starvation or gets picked off by a hunter. Or, or decapitates it. Those right, are my or, favorite ones. Right, or decapitates yeah. and just walks around with its skull on its head for, like, the rest Very of its cool. life. I, I like, yeah. I like the... Not the rest of its life, they shed their antlers. Oh, that's yeah, true. Go. That's true. <laughs> You're right. Okay, I, I, so. I, like, I like the comment that I see on those every once in a while. It's like, do you think it whispers to it at night? <laughs> It's like that fucking um, Daniel Radcliffe movie. No, <laughs> but like, uh, so, <laughs> so so on that on the topic of interest specific combat, uh, every once in a while killing things uh, at the University of Michigan, we have a mounted uh, mastodon, American mastodon, that was almost certainly killed in an interest specific combat. Uh, encounter with another one that like right behind the alveolus of its right tusk it has a perfectly tusk shaped hole that oh. goes straight to the brain that is very cool That's the, it must have been a, a, a ridiculously horribly upsetting thing to see and apparently it is not that uncommon well, there's... in mastodons but it's really rare in mammoths I'll, I'll, I'll let you get to the point real fast but it, just real quick because mastodons have just forward facing tusks mammoths have tusks that bow out and then back in so normally the injuries we see on those are like break, uh, broken bones like dents on the skull and stuff like that and every once in a while on mastodons we just see holes punched through things Things. So designed there's, to kill. There's the two elephants of some variety, and I don't remember if they're mammoths or mastodons. I think they're mammoths. I think it's in Nebraska. Um, it's a fossil of two of them with their tusks locked, and it looks like they were in combat and couldn't unlock their tusks, and they just died. And they I were fossilized with their skulls interlocked with one another. Yeah, I've heard of that. It's, wow. really cool. it's a really cool fossil. It's in, I think, in Nebraska, I want to say. Oh, huh. yeah. This is why I like the Pleistocene fossil record, is it exists <laughs> and there's a lot of things. So we occasionally see not not just one tantalizing fossil that attests to an entire species existence, but like weird freak things that don't happen a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I I love that. Yeah, so really briefly, it's um Damn it, I thought whatever, anyway, it's like two whole skeletons. Here's just the the skulls locked together Great. excellent picture quality love it that's how we're going to leave it in the video i'm not going <laughs> to pop it up on screen it'll just be amelia shows you on her phone in the corner of the screen so one of the things that's always kind of struck me about the design of pentaceratops in this game is that it is so damn leggy like, it is way leggier than every other Ceratopsian I've ever seen. This was a tall boy. And from my bit of research into it, that seems to possibly bear out. But it's, like, not talked about, which is weird. Because that seems like... We always have a joke that Ceratopsians are just heads with a body, too, I guess, sometimes. <laughs> that I... I keep saying that one of these days at SVP, I want to gather all the Ceratopsian researchers together and have them play pin the head on the Ceratopsian and <laughs> see if they can actually distinguish them from anything besides, from anything post-crania. Oh, uh, um, James, you remember Sean, right? I remember Sean. That's what his, dis I mean, that's his dissertation work is he's trying to do revised Ceratopsian phylogeny with like additional post-cranial characters. Thank God. Oh, that'd be good. You mean more than two? Yeah. <laughs> oh my more God. than two. Yeah, and it, it seems that Pentaceratops was, well, I guess seemingly a bit more unique than we see in other Ceratopsians. 
Yeah, and I mean, again, uh, judging again from that Sam Noble specimen, which is technically Titanoceratops, but they're close, closely related, right? Or are they not? Well, yeah, here's a, that's up not. in the air. But here's here's they're, they're not particularly close, but I think the postcranium is Pentaceratops. It probably is. The head is Titanoceratops. It said so on okay. the Wikipedia page. It says that the skeleton is restored after Pentaceratops. <laughs> And that whole okay. specimen was considered Pentaceratops for a while. It was one of those things where it was referred based on like superficial similarity. And then okay. when studied, the head like didn't have any traits of Pentaceratops and had a lot of traits more like Triceratops. So it got a new name. But I think it's okay. mounted on a, but... on a Penta skeleton. Okay, so if that yeah. is a Pentaceratops skeleton, they do have fur, fur a Ceratopsy and they look pretty leggy. Mm-hmm. Pretty tall. Yeah. Which, I mean, I guess if your skull is almost 11 feet long, you have to have your body <laughs> off the ground a little bit. It just, does help. Just give it a little bit of ground clearance. <laughs> the, the one thing that is worth noting about most ceratopsian skeletons in museums, though, is that often the postcranium is not from the skull. Yeah. And sometimes the postcranium is not from the species. We, James, did you just say that the postcranium isn't from the skull? You know what I mean. It doesn't go to the skull. Oh, the individual. Okay, okay. No, 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 no. That that gave me like a genuine. I was just like, yeah. Yeah. And... yeah no <laughs> shit, Dr. Napoli. Actually, yeah. Well, we have uh, ceratopsian embryos, and we can see as they develop. All head. It's all, it's all head. <laughs> right. So, so I'm, what I'm saying is that not only is. Like, ceratopsian remains are pretty common. We talked about this in the Triceratops video. Like, it's really common to find isolated bones of them. And pentaceratops is super common, too, in its formations. Right. But finding a whole ceratopsians is really rare. So it, it's kind of a, you know, if you're a ceratopsian paleontologist, you do get a benefit of there's a lot of material. But it's mostly isolated elements. And mm-hmm. often for museums, especially back in the day, they would essentially just reconstruct a skeleton based on a different species and put the head on it. So it can be really, really risky when you're trying to do, like, if you're trying to do a skeletal drawing or paleo art, if you see a museum mount without knowing the history of it really well, like, you're going to have some weird results. Like, again, and I know I bring this up a lot, the Triceratops at the AM&H is seven individuals cobbled together and it's got weird proportions because of that there's not many complete triceratops fossils but the ones we have don't have the same proportions because they're one individual not seven of different ages and sizes cobbled together to make a museum (laughs) mount so you know museum skeletal mounts are kind of a blessing and a curse when they're based on really good specimens they provide a lot of information and helpful context with how the bones articulated how large the animal was but they can be misleading, especially because back in like the 20s, people were mainly going for display pieces. They weren't going for scientific rigor. You know, dinosaurs weren't considered to have scientific importance. The scientific importance of dinosaurs was that they made people who were uneducated come to museums and pay to see them so that you could spend that money working on mammal teeth. Mm-hmm. And the real science. The real science, which was usually <laughs> about trying to prove that humans had either originated in Europe and degenerated into other parts of the world, or some other version of you know racist pseudoscientific Biological nonsense. Biological racism. Right. Don't let mammal paleontologists get all high and mighty on it. Speaking saying. of Osborne. <laughs> Speaking of Henry Fairfield Osborne, why did you go to Asia? <laughs> Speaking of racism, the man. Henry Fairfield Osborne... It, is a wonderful example to me of like the the problems of all the problems just the problems of the problems he well, was he's so a great exa- comically racist it's a great example because people will often be like oh you know he, they, they might have been racist but like it didn't affect their science especially if they like worked on dinosaurs and split right or if it's far enough away from humans where you're like do you want to know why they found velociraptor <laughs> We have a whole cut section was so of the Archaeornithomimus video <laughs> of why they found the And one day, if you guys, maybe we'll make that a Patreon exclusive one day. If you pay us money, you can see our We'll tell you about, about how racist Henry Fairfield Osborne really was. Right. I mean, he was so Henry. racist that the other racists were like, buddy, you gotta calm that <laughs> down. He, he had like, big HP Lovecraft energy. I, I mean, I'm sure that if they had met, they would have been great friends. They were alive at the same time. Yeah, but Lovecraft never left his f- 
the house. He was scared of air conditioning. He wrote a whole short story about it. <laughs> Incorrect. He was outside quite a bit. He just never left Providence. That was his first problem. Yeah, you gotta leave Providence. a shocking number of friends. Yeah, it's a little weird. Anyway, I want to talk... So, Scott, you mentioned that Pentaceratops is really common in its formations. And I want to talk about its formations. What are they? Right. So this is the first representative we see in this game. I think it might be the only representative we see in this game, other than Parasaurolophus on a technicality, of an animal from the Fruitland Formation. It's also now been discovered in the Kirtland Formation, and I think several others as well. It was Kirtland first, if memory serves. I, no, it was Fruitland first. Really? Oh, yes. okay. I'm saying Kirtland. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. Are you guys sure. saying Kirtland or Kirtland? Kirtland. 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 Lend. Okay, thank you. Sorry. I, no, I said Kirkland the first time, like the Costco brand, and then mm -hmm. James corrected me. Also, so speaking of Kirkland, hi, Jim. We know you watch these videos, and we appreciate your support. You're hi, cool Jim. Guy. We like you. Yeah. Yes, hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. I'm excited to work on your We'll name a formation stuff. after you. We can't do that, but we will. <laughs> we don't have the power to do that. We do Make not it have right the above power. the Kirkland formation. You go from the Kirkland to the Kirkland. <laughs> Just to be confusing. Confuse nobody. Right. So... This gets into an interesting question of, so the Kirtland and the Fruitland formations are primarily, you'll see that my screen just got a lot brighter, blowing out my exposure on the camera. This is because I pulled up an Excel spreadsheet. Flashbang. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> That's what it feels like a lot of the time. So the Kirtland and the Fruitland formations are mostly found from the southern end of Laramidia in what's now the United States. Like, not the southern end of what the paleo continent Laramidia was, but like southern Utah, New Mexico. The, these are the main exposures of these areas. And so there's been this idea for a long time that's gotten some pushback, and I'll explain it in a minute, that the reason that the animals in the southern part of Laramidia were different than what we see in northern Laramidia at the same time is because of what we'd call extreme endemism, which would mean that endemism on this scale refers to the tendency of biotas to be different from each other so one species can be endemic if it's native to an area endemism on a scale like this is referring to the tendency of different sets of species to co-occur with each other which indicates like a broad scale faunal difference like you'd say that australia has a highly endemic fauna because most of the animals in australia uh, or like the surrounding islands in oceania are kind of unique to there it's a highly endemic or fauna. madagascar right madagascar is yeah. another great mm -hmm. example right so the hypothesis was that because the Campanian stage of the Cretaceous is really, really well sampled across North America, and we find that where we dig, we find different sets of dinosaurs, it would indicate that maybe because of mountain building with the origin of the Rocky Mountains, North America was being split into these different regional basins that were kind of serving as like, imagine the Great Valley in the land before time, because it's approximately a scientifically valid but that there were these different great <laughs> valleys that had a completely unique set of animals. So it's like- Amelia, talk to us about tree stars <laughs> and how can I eat them? Oh my God. Anyway, so like up north in Canada in the Campanian, you've got like the dinosaur park formation. So you have like Gorgosaurus and Lambiosaurus and Styracosaurus. And then you move south and you've got Myasaura and Chasmosaurus and uh, what else co-occurs with those animals? Struthiomimus. Struthiomimus, right. Then you move even further south and you get into the Kirtland and you start to see more Parasaurolophus and more Pentaceratops. And that it was like, as you go over the mountain range, the di there's related animals, but they're always different. So, so there was, so this, it, it turns out, based on the work of a paleontologist and stratigrapher Denver Fowler, that... It seems that the age constraint, that the impression that all of these Campanian stages were concurrent with each other was basically the result of improper uh, calibration for geochronological analyses. And what he showed in a paper that comes with an attached giant Excel spreadsheet that's currently blowing my eye light, your, my eye light, my retinas out with the light because it's so bright on my screen in this dark room I record in, um, is that essentially the beds that we have are slightly not at the same time across the continent mm -hmm. and he argued in that paper that what we're actually seeing far more likely is that the the animals are changing over time 
and we're sampling in different places only a limited amount of the total history of the Earth, but that also in each individual place we're seeing a slightly different time slice. And so there might be some signal of geographic ranges. It's very possible Pentaceratops only lived in the southern half of, of Laramidia. We can't really exclude that. But what he's essentially saying in this paper is the places we find Pentaceratops are of a particular age, and they're not the same age as the formations in Canada where we don't find Pentaceratops. On the topic of these Canadian places where we don't find Pentaceratops, uh, there's apparently an asterisk on that because there is at least one specimen that from Dinosaur Park proper that has been referred to Pentaceratops, hmm. but is... Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's it's up in the air. Uh, it was uh, 2014 by Longrich. Um, hmm. And uh, he even named it a new species, uh, Pentaceratops um, Achillonius. Memory serves? I'm dyslexic. I can't read. No, that is um, correct. Oh, good. Um, and it's been really hotly debated, and a lot of people consider it a nomen dubium, but uh, if it does prove to be pentaceratops, that would be interesting. What is interesting also about pentaceratops is that it is known from both the Kirtland and Fruitland formations. And those are not at the same. Those are definitely not contemporary. But they're mm -hmm. in the same area. They're stacked. So the Fruitland is older than the Kirtland, which might mean that we, if all of that material is the same species, which is always hard to tell. If like if they were alive today, would we call them the same species? That's the question I'll answer in the rest of my career. Um, it is possible that we actually see a geological like range where Pentaceratops existed, right? Which is going to be approximately between. 76 and 73 and a half million years ago which is not an unreasonable lifespan for a species especially if it's only a portion of that mm -hmm. species right. generally last on the order of a million years very very ballpark estimate i have a dumb question and if it's too involved to answer don't um how so how 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 is he determining that these this isn't just like a transgressive margin or something you mean fowler who and what Sorry, the, the, the like record the, that this that these are different ages and not like different parts of a well, it's it's radiometric constraints on the oh okay that no, was what, easy that was easy to answer yeah no what Fowler did was he basically applied recently determined age corrections based on like finer analyses of how the radiometric decay was occurring to old samples and he gotcha. reanalyzed everything and it was like actually if you do it with the calibrations we know you need to do it with everything's a slightly different age. If you do it smart, you get the answer. Because, like, <laughs> where's Dinosaur Park? This is the only problem with it. Like, Dinosaur Park is only between 77 and 75 and a half million years ago. The Dinosaur Park it, formation. So it's Campanian. a real... It's, it's Campanian, but it's 76 to 75 and a half. And that's about when the Kirtland and Fruitland start to pick up. Oh, so, so the, the range of uncertainty is a little... Well, it's not the range of uncertainty. It's basically like, I mean, those are the those are the documented ages. Those are the upper and lower boundings. Right, but so like gotcha. okay. the the Kirtland formation is not the same age as the Dinosaur Park formation, which mm -hmm. means that the fact that you don't find the same dinosaurs in the two of them can't be taken to indicate a geographic separation. It it would probably be a temporal change, and it's possible okay. that the species that we find in both lived across the whole continent. I see. Yeah. Thank you for explaining. You're welcome. There, there's two things I want to bring up about the skull of the animal as it's depicted in the game. Uh, one of them is just why it's called Pentaceratops, because, you know, Penta, we think about a pentagram, five that points, five sides, Penta is the root for five. So like Triceratops, Tri being three is three horned face. Pentaceratops is five horned face. But yet I see five, I see three horns. And if we're counting hornlets, the specifications, I see much more than five. Uh, but it's because they're counting the three on the face and then these two epijugal uh, hornlets, which are these little horns on the cheek. So there's one on that side and one over yonder. So you got five horns, five horned face. I think that's kind of judicious. 
I think they're being a little bit charitable on counting those horns at the, the same tier as the the horns on the the face now, here. But could that just be that this is one of these one of, a pretty early discovered ceratopsian and Taurus or and Triceratops? Exactly they're kind why. Of, and Pentaceratops, they're meaty. Yeah, yeah. Pentaceratops, they are a little bit bigger, so I could see. You know, if you're trying to fit a theme. Like, yeah. Are there are there other since then like chas chasmosaurians with big epijugal ossifications that we know of? I mean, I almost so. all of them have relatively large epijugals. I, I think. Okay, so, I, yeah. I, I know nothing about certain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the other the other thing I want to bring up about this design that's been bothering me the whole episode, and I just want to confirm that I'm not going insane. Do you guys think this is the attempt that this is is the rendition of the ear hole? Oh no! Oh no! I think you're right. Zoom in on it. Enhance. Enhance. Oh no. Um. Maybe. Can I? See, can I see the other side? I think it's just a weird divot. It'd be a weird texturing thing. It's 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 kind of some of the skins make it harder to see. I'm trying to find one. The white ones tend to be the most dramatic, I think. But let me see if I can find the ones that aren't in the water. Oh, wait, 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 wait. That's the lateral temporal fenestra. Well, so that's the lateral. Yes, that's what it is. But do you think that they've drawn it as an ear hole? I, I think so. I don't. I see no other ear. No, because there's skin in it. Yeah, that's. Yes, but I don't think that anything I, I, the nostril has skin in it. Like, that's just. Oh, how, how oh you're textured. right. It does. Like they don't actually make a hole in the in the model. They have to to block it just because it's you know it's made of triangles. I don't know. It's maybe I, I, I don't know. It just I think so. I'm inclined it's... to say yes. Which it's important to note the ear hole would have been like tucked away in here. Yeah, it's behind the frill. Can you zoom Not in like... just one more time for me? Let me get let me get into the. Uh... The close-up cam. It's been a minute since we used this one. I don't think they're making this the ear. It's too subtle. Like, I don't know what it is. I think it's just a weird pocket, but it's not... Well, no, I mean, that is where there's a hole in the head. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna have to disagree with you guys. I think that... I, I, I'm thinking that that would... Is possibly an ear hole, because, like, is it subtle? Yes, but it's still very deliberate. It's not but like I'm... the 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 sweat stains on the legs of the Archaeornithomimus, where I'm like, oh, like I can see this being an error. The color, like, they're obviously dark, like, the color inside of the nostril is darker. And I think that's intentional, right? I like, think they it's just because it... the lip is large, like, the, the, the rim is larger. Like, I think if this was gonna, if this was the, supposed to be the latter, like, the, the fenestra, it wouldn't be darkened at all. Fine. We need to see another one. Go to another one. Go to a light colored one. But yeah, maybe that one. That's an ear. Oh, that's worse. All right, yeah, no, that's. I mean, it's not. It, it's not the ear, but I think it's supposed to be. The I ear. think that's how they've done it, which it's is coded a, as the ear. A, a mistake, what about the blue unfortunate one? mistake, but uh, the blue one. Sure. I just like it because it's pretty. It is very pretty. Something to be said about this 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 design this animal. I think it's gorgeous. I don't know because in that one, like on the right side, it looks like it's less embayed. This one, you're right. Yes. Yeah, we're gonna. I'm gonna say I won't assume. Well, okay. Uh, on a on a detail about this model that I can praise a little bit more um, is I, I know we talked in the Styracosaurus video that it looked like even though the feet on the Ceratopsians in this game are a little screwed up, this ones look the best to me. Like, look at their hands. They there's like. They're facing the... Do they have too many claws? Yeah, but they're, like, kind of facing outwards like they're supposed to. If you even look at the back, they're very much not elephantine. They have, like, a little divot in the back there oh, that yeah. we see on the trackways mm -hmm. of Ceratopsians. These are, with the exception of those extra... Uh, with it, it has too many claws. And when I, what I mean by that is digits four and five shouldn't have claws, like on alligators. Um... But this seems to be relatively good Ceratopsian feet. Yeah, the fingers kind of splay, which I like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the closest to correct we've seen. 
it's not Triceratops. No. No, it's not. Do we want to rank it? I'm ready to rank it if other people I'm ready to rank it. I have nothing else to say. So, I like it. Yeah, uh, it's one of the better Ceratopsians in the game, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's good. This is an extremely muted. <laughs> well, we need to. It's we're, very we're, good. We're, we're going out of order. Um, it's Amelia starts. Right. Oh, sorry. Right. Oh, is this the official? Okay, gotcha. Sorry. Are we? Yeah. Kind of... Oh. Yeah, no, okay, yeah, no, I mean, I like it because I'm a sucker for Ceratopsians, and also, like, even though it's not quite right, or I guess we don't really know, um, I like that it looks like a cursed reptile bison thing with the big arched back and long gangly forearms. Um, yeah, no, it's ridiculous, but I like it. I'll give it an A. Yeah, I like this design a lot. I think it, it's among the better Ceratopsian designs in the game, although I'm struggling to think of one I do think is better. Styracosaurus? I mean, I love Styracosaurus. Yeah, I mean, Styracosaurus, I'd say, is about on par with this for me. I like Styracosaurus better as a dinosaur, but this is really a good design as well. I like what they've done with the color on the frill. I like that they don't make the frill incredibly gaudy, but show a very plausible way where you can have, like, thin stripes of bright color. But not, like, it's not obnoxious. It's just flashy. I like okay. its color schemes. I like its feet. I like the design. I I'm struggling between A and S for this. I'm gonna well, give it's not it an a S. Design. I'll give it an S. All right. We can work this out in the voting. Democracy um, in action. We'll we'll count the hanging chads and everything. Um. So I also think that this is one of my favorite Ceratopsians in the game, that they kind of just nailed it. That this one... This one just looks like an animal uh, in, in a very naturalistic way. That, like, its idiosyncrasies just strike me as just kind of, like... I don't know, it feels organic. And uh, I'll, I'll expound on a bit of what James said. Of I, I really like the frill patterns and the frill coloration, and that it's not super over the top. Uh, it, actually, it's kind of funny. The one that we picked here is the one that I, I never choose in the game because whenever I see it, it's the exact shades of, like, red, yellow, and blue and green that you see on, like, infrared cameras, <laughs> and it always makes me think about that every time I see it. It looks like it's frill is like a, it being seen in infrared and it always throws me off but um i i also really like that there's one uh pattern on there that is like white stripes which i think is interesting that that oftentimes we see dinosaurs with some bold colors on display structures i'm also a sucker for some more bold patterns as well and we don't see that as much and i i like that we can do that on here so i oh man i think i'll give it an a i like it okay. a lot well you know, scott says bold and brash and i say it belongs in the trash <gasps> no i'm kidding i just want to do a joke um it is not my favorite Ceratopsian. There is one in this game that I think is much cooler. Uh, we'll save that. Actually, there might be two that I think are better designs, um, but it is it is solid. Uh, and looking at its face, I'm just reminded of how, how awful and horrid this thing would look without cheeks, and that it definitely had cheeks. Oh, um, God, yeah. I think this deserves, I would say, a high B. Or a low A. And I'm going to flip a coin to the side. <laughs> and this coin is going to be this bottle cap. We're giving it a high B. Interesting. I would um, also like to protest something that James did, which was uh, what I call the coward's S, knowing that no one else will put it in an S. He can, you know, attempt to look like a big Ceratopsian stand. How he could I know either. that? How could I know that? <laughs> I went like, oh, no. second. <laughs> well, I'm going to I'm going to confirm the coward's S because I'm not going to give this an S. Yes, that's what I thought. <laughs> I'm giving this an A. I think this is an A tier. Uh, it's probably, uh, yeah, between this and maybe Styracosaurus of I think the best Ceratopsian designs in the game. 
uh, this one is, I think, a very faithful rendition of, of the animal. You know, uh, like, yeah, a few, like maybe the hump's too extreme. Ear hole, don't love it. But it's got like even like this little like stretching like bit of skin between the leg and the body is really really nice. I've been watching that like the whole time. Like it just looks real. Um, yeah, is that I propatagium. No, mm, it, it wouldn't be that... called that. I, I've heard them mm. called patagia, but it, it's just. It's just a skin fold. A lot, almost every animal has it. Um, but yeah, I really, I really like this design. I think it's really solid. I think it's a very good depiction of Pentaceratops, um, and I think the colors do its service. The behaviors do its service. I like when it kind of rubs its face on the ground. Um, that looks animal. like maybe it's like scent marking or like scratching its uh, scratching its face. Um, I like that. I think it's an A. So. If we're all in agreement, I think we can say that Pentaceratops is right A, a tier. Woo! And now and our, we have to update the other ones. Oh yes, this is critically important. It's been brought to our attention that Jehalopterus belongs in H tier. As does Sinoceropterus. As does Sinoceropterus. Right. Is it time, time to, to? It's time to spin. Spin that, that, that wheel. Wheel. Can you see the wheel? Yeah. Yes, okay. yeah, I see the wheel. All right, are you ready to spin the wheel? Let's spin yes, it right. we did the bit. Wheel. Thank you, Scott, for reminding me that we did the bit. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh my God. Oh, wow. wow. God. We're Another, on the streak. One for two other timing. Yay. Oh, God. It means we have to talk about ontogeny again. All right, guys. So next week, join us for another Ceratopsian that we're going to record uh, literally two minutes from when we stop recording this video, but it'll be released a week later because we've got schedules to maintain. So <laughs> if you want to see more Chasmosaurian Ceratopsians, make sure that you subscribe to our channel and hit that little bell so that you get notified every time we talk about large frilled dinosaurs that have holes in their frills and three horns that point forward. From North America. Have From we done North Chasmosaurus specifically. yet? Chasmosaurus isn't in the game. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. What are you talking about? Oh, yeah. it is. Right. Jesus. But we haven't done it. We haven't done All it. All right. So it's as of memorable. next video, we will have done three of the four. <laughs> right. Um, we're doing really good. So join us next week. Thank you guys, as always, for watching. It means a lot to us that you support the channel. So thank you, and we'll see you soon.